All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon um, to talk with and hear from our friends, Ryan Rydzetsky and Greg Baer, about their book, When You Wonder, You're Learning. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we do have copies of it on the table in the back, um, so please be sure to take one with you before you go today if you don't already have your own copy if you haven't read it yet, and I'm sure Greg and Ryan would be happy to sign them as well. All right, Mary Frances, I'm gonna, oh, before I turn it over to Mary Frances, um, our wonderful speakers are gonna remove their masks just to make it easier to hear and to record. Um, so if anyone would like to move further back before that happens, please go ahead and do so. All right. We are all vaccinated <laughs> up here, so anyway. Um, so thank you everybody for coming and thank you Greg and Ryan for doing this for us. It was a really great book. Um, I enjoyed reading it. I've got some questions for you and then I think our audience will have some questions. First I just want to start, you know, set us up. How did you come to write this book? What sort of inspired or motivated you and what told you now was the time? Yeah, so really this book is 15 years in the making. <laughs> and it springs forth from work that's happened here in this library, in schools across Western Pennsylvania, and also in after school programs, early learning centers, other sites of learning. 15 years ago, this region started to remake learning and really reimagine what it is that kids today need, knowing that they develop their identities differently, seek affirmation differently, consume and produce information differently. And educators across this region started to make a bet that, in fact, if kids were developing differently, and neuroscience has now told us that, in fact, their brains are developing differently because of social and technological change, what types of experiences, what types of environments, what type of instruction did we need to provide for today's kids? We mentioned that because very early on, we started talking about Fred Rogers. And it's easier now in 2021 than it was 15 years ago to talk about this, but you can think about Fred and what he did in the context of the Fred method. And it's an easy equation. Whole, sci whole child learning plus learning sciences equals the Fred method. And that second part of the equation, learning sciences, is really critical because for me and for Ryan, our aha was seeing Fred Rogers not just as that loving character on our television, not just as a remarkable teacher, but as a learning scientist, as a learning engineer who was incredibly deliberate about his work and who in so many ways was 50 years ahead of what learning sciences now tells us we need to do in support of kids. And when you read learning science reports that come out of the University of Pittsburgh next door or Carnegie Mellon University next door, MIT, the University of Washington, it feels like you're reading a blue script from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And so we wanted to tell that story of Fred Rogers as a learning scientist, but to do so in a way that makes, and makes evident that his work is as relevant, if not more so, in 2021 than in 1968 when production started. So this book ultimately was three years in production, so much of which happened here in these library rooms and walls. And, um, and it's a story we love to tell about Fred Rogers as a loving teacher who was also a learning scientist. And we need to think of him that way and learn from him. So how did you guys collaborate, Ryan? Maybe you can tell us how did you divide up the work? Who did what? Sure. So it was, um, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, so I am a writer by training. I went to Chatham for my MFA. Greg checks my worst impulses, which is to go down every possible rabbit hole. Uh, he's a great writer in his own right. So really, it was a lot of, of back and forth. Um, like Greg said, we started going to learning science conferences. And we started reading research papers. And we started talking to people in the academic world who are learning about learning. And they just sounded so much like Fred. They, were, they weren't speaking scientifically. Uh, at least at first, they were talking about how do we make sure kids feel safe? How do we make sure kids feel like they belong to a community that cares about them? How do we make sure that kids are loved and capable of loving, which is a Fred, Fred, or phrase Fred used all the time. And you know, as we were going back and forth thinking about like, okay, so what did this look like in practice? 
in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood? And how can we go find examples of it happening now in Pittsburgh? And that's where we really drew from Remake Learning, the work that Greg and others have done, to go find who are the people who are using the FRED method in 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, we had no shortage of examples to draw from, including two of your colleagues who are here right now, Kristen and Simon, which are fantastic. Um, I actually haven't seen either of you since that interview. The world got a little bit weird after that. So <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of the book. Um, so to answer your question, Mary Frances, it was a lot of trying to figure out what are the, the key points that scientists and educators are talking about, what's important, and who can we go find to, one, validate that, make sure it actually works in practice, and two, spotlight in ways that readers who aren't in Pittsburgh or even who aren't familiar with FRED would find practical and accessible and hopefully fun and joyful. Great. So um, are you both uh, products of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Did you watch it <laughs> growing up? We are. You know, we're yes. Western Pennsylvania kids. And I suspect most of you know. I was going to say, how many in the audience are Mr. Rogers' <laughs> Neighborhood kids? Right? So yeah, 19... look at that. See, I was a little, I babysat for kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? I mean, Fred Rogers, I mean, you think about that production airing for 40 years. Yeah. The number of generations that he touched, whether it was me watching with my brother or maybe alongside my mom, sometimes alongside my grandma, right? It really was multi-generational. And I know Ryan had the same experience in his household. And yep. mm -hmm. for those of us now also parents to have the successor series in Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, drawing upon that great um, storyline of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in an animated modern way. Uh, he, you know, it, his story is well known. His, it, the environment he created is well known. And so the book has an emotional heart tug, I think, for so many of us. Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the final episode airing in 2001. So um, I like to say that although I have more gray hair than Greg does, I was part of the last cohort to watch <laughs> Mr. Rogers as he was airing new episodes. So I, I thought that is one of my questions. Um, he was a national and international figure, but he is also very uniquely Pittsburgh's. Yes. But as we look ahead, and you mentioned Daniel Tiger, but as we look ahead, as the recollection of his presence sort of recedes and younger people take, rise up, um, how do we, or how do you think his legacy can continue to impact our community? Because I do think it does now. Yes. And how do we, and maybe that's partly why you wrote the book, but how, how do we ensure that impact going forward? Well, partly it's adopting that FRED method and really studying and learning from it. I don't think we could have predicted 20 years ago the resurgence of Fred Rogers' legacy. And in some ways in popular culture, whether it's because of disasters and people referring to that refrain of look for the helpers, mm -hmm. or we see in popular culture and media, Morgan Neville's enormously successful documentary or the you know, popular the film starring Tom Hanks. In some ways, Fred Rogers is more part of popular culture than ever before. So what that holds of the future, um, it'll be interesting to see how that legacy holds. What we're finding as we have an opportunity to go to schools, and meet with folks personally and virtually across the United States, but also in places like Japan and Argentina and elsewhere where Fred Rogers really isn't that particularly well known. The book is resonating because his work is so accessible. Mm -hmm. It's pro approachable and they can see the replicability not only in his work, but in the examples of the Carnegie Library, of Steeltown, of the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, that people see that work in modern ways that they think, well, that's replicable, I can do that, and I can understand how to apply the learning sciences in ways even though I'm not a learning engineer. And I think that's how we keep that legacy going. Yeah, and um, I would just add that I, when I think of Mr. Rogers, I, I try to compare it to like my favorite days at school. Like my, what, were, what were my favorite days I remember? My moments of like real learning and self-definition. And those were usually things like, oh, we went on a field trip, I'll never forget that or I had this really great interaction with a teacher who I just loved, or I got to make something that I still remember making today. Those were the kinds of things that we did every single day in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Those are the kinds of things that the folks in Pittsburgh, the educators, the librarians, the museum curators are, are trying to do today. Now, in one sense, that could happen anywhere. You know, any place with enough resources can put together really fun activities for kids, can take kids places, can help them do things. 
But I think what makes Pittsburgh unique, and I think this comes from Fred to a degree, is that emphasis on none of that stuff is going to work unless we focus on building connection and building relationships. And that's one thing that I heard again and again, and I heard it specifically from Simon and Kristen at the labs. Like, we have all these great tools. We have all these amazing things that are going to get kids in the door. Any place can do that. But if we want kids to get something out of it, if we want the experiences here to change them in positive ways, help them grow as human beings, then we have to focus on relationships. And I think that is the legacy that Fred left us in Pittsburgh. We don't always live up to it, of course, but um, it's something that we saw just about every place we went. And Mary Frances, if I can add, because we underline Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. as you did in your question, right? And it takes me back to that brief description of remake learning and the culture that we've created in this region. Part of, I think, what has propelled Remake Learning forward is having that storyline of the Fred method, having that connection to understanding our work in the context of Fred Rogers. And it's why you know, having that emotional storyline is so powerful to the broader work of reimagining learning experiences. And I think uh, you know, that really drives us here in this, in this region of Western Pennsylvania. So um, in the event that people are not 100% familiar with Remake Learning, do you have an elevator speech yes. that you can give so that they understand what it is? It's so actually an elevator speech, <laughs> but go ahead. In 2021, Remake Learning is a network that consists of more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, after school programs, campuses of higher education, and creative industries that together are advancing what we describe as relevant, engaging, and equitable learning for young people whom we know are experiencing rapid social and technological change. So Remake Learning is a network to which libraries or schools or other organizations and the thousands of educators in and out of school, pre-K through higher education can turn for grant support, for communications support, for meetups to find colleagues who maybe are addressing maker-centered learning or computational thinking or in other innovative approaches and thinking about it in the context of equity and justice. So it's a, it's, it's a peer network of grown-ups eager to reimagine learning experiences and to have the resources of abundance in connecting with one another in human relationships, but then the grants and the communications and other things to make that go. And just so everyone knows, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh was one of, I think, one of the original. Very original. Uh, members of the Remake Learning. Um, and Greg has been such a champion of our work and has really inspired through funding, but through his belief also in the value of what we do, um, all of the good work that we do with children and teens at our library. And so I think we are very grateful for this opportunity because I think we've built something wonderful together. Well, you have built some, and it's a story that Ryan and I love to tell. It's obviously why we put it in the book. It's something that we love to talk about because very early on, you all and your colleagues recognized that libraries, if reimagined, could connect with today's kids. And the work that happened here with the teen labs, with the labs, but also in children's services and across the library system, you've reinvented what it means to be uh, in a library. And I love walking into that space downstairs to see books and to see librarians, but occasionally to see maybe a hip hop artist, to see a gamer, to see equipment, to see a guitar on the wall, to see a place that kids want to come and hang out and mess around and geek out, as we love to say, borrowing from the, the work of Mimi Ito at Cal Irvine, uh, when she talks about creating spaces where kids want to hang out, mess around, and geek out. And I will say personally, um, I love libraries, and I have a personal connection. I come from a family of librarians, uh, my grandma, my great aunt, um, after whom uh, my first daughter, Catherine, is named. This is a great short story, but my aunt Catherine, um, she essentially led the library system in Washington, D.C. And um, take you back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s, you know, sadly, no woman was going to be allowed to lead the library mm -hmm. system, so there were a group of men who led the library. But it was really my Aunt Catherine who was running the system. It was she, when they had to go up to Capitol Hill at that time um, to secure their appropriations, just given the way the, the Capitol system then worked at that point, she was the one testifying. She was the one who had all of the answers. She was the one who made that system go. And on top of that, she was a great storyteller, which librarians often are. Um, <laughs> she had storytelling at her core. And um, I'm hopeful I got a little bit of it, but ideally I passed it on to my daughter, Catherine. Maybe she'll be a librarian. She might be. I'd be so <laughs> proud. So um, in reading the book, 
I was actually reminded of another Mr. Rogers, humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers. Uh, he coined a phrase, unconditional positive regard, within the context of a therapeutic relationship. And I know that um, in the book we talk about unconditional love, but I think in, in what we do in the library, unconditional positive regard is probably a little bit more accurate on how we try to approach all of our patrons. Um, but I, can you speak to the um, impact of truly understanding and valuing each child for who they are? And how do we do that with kids we know well and those we briefly encounter, as well as in a group setting and one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. Sure. So um, as a former teacher, I think I can speak maybe a little bit about how do you approach a, a child that you don't know well, at least yet. And the thing that jumps to mind from the book is uh, the concept of deep listening and loving speech, which we borrow from a Buddhist monk and philosopher, Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I think the way Thich Nhat Hanh talks about communication perfectly describes how Rogers did it. And uh, deep listening basically does one particular thing. It acknowledges and, and respects the feelings of another person, even if you don't agree with those feelings. You know, children or maybe library patrons or political opponents or strangers have feelings that can just be baffling to us. You know, they don't account for our experiences. They don't follow our own personal logic. They just don't make sense. Um, I think what Thich Nhat Hanh means by deep listening and how Fred applied it in the neighborhood was when you make space to listen to those feelings anyway, to listen to a person who you don't know that well and maybe don't agree with without injecting your experiences or projecting you know, your assumptions or even trying to you know, jam in your well-intentioned words of wisdom. You make space to make those big feelings, whatever that person's bringing to you, you make space to men make it mentionable. And as Fred used to say, anything that's mentionable becomes more manageable. And I think that at least is the first step to unconditional positive regard, letting people know that regardless of what they're coming to you with, whether it's a child or an adult, um, that they are acceptable. You know, the core message of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was, I like you just the way you are, which sounds simple on its face, but if you try to apply that to every single person you meet, you realize how quickly it becomes difficult. And I think that is part of the reason why we revere Fred today. It's part of the reason why we still have such a connection to him today, and it's one of the most valuable things I think we can learn from him today. Can I'd like to share an example, too, when we think about unconditional positive regard. Yeah. Because those of you who read the book, you can see that at the end of each chapter, what we did is we curated examples of, of the very people with whom we spoke to identify tactical things we can do. Because in some ways, what you described is a mindset and its approach. But what are the concrete things we can do that would influence our own behaviors? And one example that Ryan and I love to cite comes from Hedda Sherapin who herself is an educator, began working with Fred Rogers on the first day of production in 1968. And she talks about the Ask It Basket. So I'd like to connect the Ask It Basket mm -hmm. to your question, because the Ask It Basket is a wicker basket that Hedda saw in a classroom as she was visiting. And curious, you know, what's that whisker, wicker basket in the front? And as the, as the classroom unfolded and the teacher's instruction um, unfolded, what had noticed is that this teacher had created an environment that invited questions, right? So that's important because she had an environment, invited an environment where kids felt like they belonged and that they were going to be respected when they raised their hand and asked a question. And the curious thing is, I don't know if this is a 12th grade classroom or a first grade classroom, but it was that environment. What that told kids is, I can ask this question and I'm going to be respected for it and my teacher's gonna listen to me. And no matter how crazy it is, it might be on point, or this might be right over the left field wall. The teacher took that question, wasn't quick to answer it, wrote it down, so respected that question even more, put it in the basket and said, later, together, we're gonna think about that question, wonder about the answer. And all of those little things, because of the tactical basket she had put in the classroom, influenced her own behavior of creating an environment where kids felt like they belonged, that they would be respected, that they felt safe, both, you know, that they felt psychologically safe. And that's about creating an environment of that, that unconditional positive regard. And it was a, it's a tac 
tactical thing. And I think it's such a beautiful example that represents layers um, to that question. I, I think it's also that, in particular, is an example of loving speech. Because yes. you know, I mentioned deep listening and loving speech. Deep listening does make space to listen to feelings we disagree with. But it doesn't mean that we tell everybody that they're perfect or everything that they say and do is OK. You know, far from it. What loving speech asks us to do, and there's a, a tool in the book called Simple Interactions developed by the Fred Rogers Center, which can help us thinking about, think about, OK, how are we going to respond to those feelings? How are we going to respond to those questions that people bring to us? And how can we do so in a way that communicates uh, our presence, our availability to other people, uh, a sense of inclusion? Are we welcoming people? Are we making people feel safe? And in or you have to have all those things in place in order to help somebody else learn and grow. Fred used to say that no one can learn and grow unless he's loved exactly as he is right now, appreciated for what he is rather than what he will be. So how do we communicate that we appreciate a child or a library patron or a stranger? Um, we acknowledge their presence and we communicate ours, even if we disagree with that person. Is that taught in education classes today? Do they actually teach teachers how to approach the class in that way? I don't, I, I'm just curious, I don't know. So I became a teacher at the height, this was in 2009, so this was the height of No Child Left Behind, and which means it was the very height of accountability and testing, and the way I was taught to teach was you write out the steps to a math problem, say, as clearly as you can. And then you repeat them again and again and again until they get it, and then you move on. Um, I was disabused of that notion immediately upon walking into the classroom that that was going to work. Um, I, we never talked about relationships. We never talked about listening or presence or availability. Those were things that I, I hope I learned on the job. I think I would have been a better teacher had I had some preparation ahead of time and had I, had I been con conscious of and, and caring about those kind of things. But you know, one of the people we talked to in the book is Dr. Valerie Kinlock, who right. is the Dean of Education at the University of Pittsburgh, who's an amazing person in her own right. She talks about these are the things that she's thinking about. These are the things that she's talking about with her teachers in training. These are the things that you know, she considers the building blocks of building a more just and equitable school system. So I say that because I think things are changing. The fact that someone like Dr. Kinlock is in charge of an educator preparation program is so exciting to me. I think it's a win for kids. It's a win for Pittsburgh. It's a win for all of us, really. Um, I don't know if the tide has totally turned, but there are folks, I think some folks in the right positions talking about these things. And I hope the book can be a, at least a small part of that. And we need to acknowledge that there's probably a generation of educators that have not had deep, if any, work in child development theory and practice in our schools of education. Mm -hmm. And I know that because for these past 15 years, in the context of remake learning, we've had a chance to connect with deans at the nearly dozen schools of education in our region. And they will acknowledge that a core focus on child development theory and practice is not something that's central to the work of their instruction. And it relates right back to Fred, because Fred's work wasn't an accident. Yeah. And if you go back to his study alongside someone like Margaret McFarland, a, a world-class child development psych, uh, psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical School in the 1960s and 70s, that she co-founded the Arsenal Children's Center right here in Pittsburgh with Eric Erickson and, and Benjamin Spock. You just mentioned those three names. That's a Mount Rushmore right. of child <laughs> development theory and practice, not only for Pittsburgh, but for the 20th century yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Fred's work springs forth right from that. And so we think then about educators from where is their work, where is their instruction, where is their practice springing forth, and do they have exposure and opportunity um, to delve into whole child in that part of that Fred method equation. We need it, to do more. It's also interesting hearing from teachers as they read the book. You know, even if, if they never talked about these things, or we never talk to about these things explicitly. These are the things that are in all of us, and they are especially in educators. And I think when teachers read this book, a lot of them have told us this was refueling, or this reminds me why I got into it in right. the first place. And it reminds me, you know, Fred used to tell people when they would ask him for advice, I don't need to tell you what, you, what to do because you were a child once too. And I think I see a little bit, a little bit of that in educators as they read the book. 
this is in them already. Um, it's why they became teachers, and I hope that, you know, it's not us, but I think Fred can help to bring that out. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so in the past year has been um, really upended formal learning for so many children. Um, we can say that learning was kind of remade yes. on the fly. <laughs> um, so what, if any, do you think are the benefits of this forced period of remade learning, and what should we do to support children's education now? Yeah. I love this question. <laughs> so, um, this, I mean, this takes me right back to the work of Remake Learning, but it's Fred's blueprints. Fred's blueprints that he left for us are the path forward when we think about blending whole child development theory and practice with the learning sciences. And I've had the privilege of talking with any number of administrators, principals, teachers over these past 18 months and someone like Dr. Jenny Hunt at Clareton School District will say, you know what, we accelerated forward five years in our technology-enhanced learning and related planning. And for all of this disruption, for all of the poverty, trauma, challenges, there have also been incredible bright spots um, in schools, in early learning centers, in libraries, and in other sites of, of learning. And so one of the things that we've tried to do in the context of Remake Learning is to capture those, to document those, and uplift those. And in fact, during these past four or five months, Remake Learning worked together with the Pennsylvania Department of Education in, in surveying more than 1,000 educators across the Commonwealth, involving 200 administrators in intense, deep listening focus sessions, and, and trying to identify what are the things that we need to do differently in our schools going forward. Given the, um, it's hard to say the opportunity of the yeah. pandemic, but you get what I, what I mean when I say that. And so um, came forward with a, rep a report called What Comes Next that in very concrete ways tries to identify things that we wanted to imagine into being as we think about justice, as we think about methods, and we think about relationships in schools and other sites um, of learning. One concrete example is, what if schools had directors of relationships not to replace counselors, not to replace the work that teachers do in their either silent or direct mentoring, but to have someone that does nothing more than thinks 24 seven about connecting each and every student to an experience, to a network of people and others that connects to his or her passions and interests. Um, Fred Rogers, you know, at the end of the day, his blueprints speak to relationships, relationships, relationships. Well, what if we thought about supporting relationships in systemic ways, not just in accidental ways, not in hope for ways, but actually build a system that supported relationship building because we know how core that is. So I, I'm someone of a mindset who thinks that if we are going to realize genuinely systemic changes, particularly in formal education, pre-K to 12, we have a shot in these next two to three years. If we don't take advantage of that, um, shame on us. Right. Um, there's, there's one quick sort of fun study that comes to mind when you talk about this, and we write about it briefly in the book. So in 2002, a group of psychologists gave college students a fake personality test, hmm. and then they split the students into three groups based on the supposed results. And they told group one that based on the results of the test, they were going to have lasting friendships, great marriages, they were gonna be surrounded by these wonderful relationships for the rest of their lives. They told group two that unfortunately, based on your test results, your friends are going to abandon you, your marriages are going to end, and you're probably gonna die alone. They told group three that based on their test results, they were going to be prone to physical accidents, things like car crashes. And then they gave each group an IQ test. And only one group bombed it, it was group two, that that group who'd been told that they were going to be abandoned by the people that they care about. And so the researchers deduced that it wasn't bad news in general that was causing a drop in test scores because group three, the car crash group, did just fine. It was the prospect of social exclusion, of being rejected, of, of not feeling like they belong to a community that they care about. So you know, when you think about coming back from this pandemic, whatever that might look like, um, sure, we can worry about learning loss, but we're not gonna be able to address any of that without addressing relationship loss. I mean, kids, over the past year, there certainly have been opportunities for them. They've also been excluded by circumstances. Some kids have always been excluded. It had nothing to do with the pandemic. How do we address that? I, without 
without doing so, um, I don't think we can take advantage of these opportunities that have been presented. Yeah. I certainly hope they told the second group. Never mind. We were I should say that. that. I should <laughs> say that. They did. They, they did tell they, the they, they apologized like, after ruse. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you'd get away with running that study today. Uh, no, I don't think so. It doesn't sound ethical. But, <laughs> but it is informative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I see that you're wearing be, your Be the Kind Kid, and this question is, you know, I do have a lot of respect for the anti-bullying kindness curriculum that's been developed for school-aged children, and I imagine that actually Fred Rogers influenced some of that curriculum, um, either directly or indirectly. However, of late, we have seen some egregious behavior on the part of adults toward those who want to, like, wear masks in schools, yes. teaching issues around race and systemic racism, rights of transgender and non-binary youth. Um, Quite frankly, these adults are modeling behavior that is pretty concerning, and I'm worried that it would spill over into classrooms and places where kids gather without adult supervision. So how can we be proactive when we discern a potential threat to the emotional well-being of children? Oh, can I write a thesis about this? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to take that? Do you want me? Sure, I can just tell you what jumps to mind. So kindness is a tricky subject. It's obviously it was at the heart of what Fred did. It's, it's part of why we revere him today. But I think we run into trouble when we confuse kindness with just being nice or just plain civility right. or just plain passivity, saying we're not going to address this problem because we want to be nice to each other. We want to be kind to each other. Right. Um, Fred didn't do that. And that, that tends to be forgotten. You know, one of the things that shocked us, really, when we went back to watch, I don't know, hundreds of episodes in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, was how directly he confronted the real hard problems, that kind of behavior you're talking about in the world. And we were talking to Dr. Aisha White, who leads the PRIDE program at Pittsburgh, Positive Racial Identity Development and Early Education. And she was talking about this because she works with a lot of teachers who, when an issue of bullying or of race comes up, the teacher will say something like, hey, we're kind to our friends, just sort of gloss over it. And I think what we tried to convey in the book is there is a difference between just being nice and passive and truly being kind. I think we can use the words kindness and nice and civility to duck the hard conversations, to duck those hard confrontations. Um, and doing that is it's the opposite of kind. It doesn't do anybody any favors. When you do it with children, you don't teach anyone what they've done, you don't teach anyone that what they've done is hurtful. You don't help the kid who's been harmed. Um, Dr. White says we should think about kindness in terms of humanity. What does it mean to show humanity to someone? How can we be kind without using kindness um, as a cover, as a way to deflect those really hard things that seem to come up more and more? Yeah. Well, and it's a reminder, too, that Kindness is something around which we need to have community organizing. Fred Rogers talked about creating atmospheres for learning. An atmosphere for learning isn't created by one asket basket. It's created by thousands of asket baskets and thousands of asket basket moments. And what, one of the things that I love about the Be the Kind Kid movement, and there ought to be also a Be the Kind Grown Up movement, <laughs> but when we think about the Be the Kind Kid movement, it's about schools that have these student-led clubs that are organized around kindness. It's about kids every Wednesday wearing their um, Be the Kind Kid t-shirt. It's, it's a practice behavior. We need to practice um, behavior. We need to practice saying out loud the importance of being kind. And, and that requires an ongoing community organizing around kindness. Just today, um, the Born This Way Foundation, created by Lady Gaga and her mom, launched Be Kind 21. So for a number of years in a row now, the Born This Way Foundation has had a 21-day organizing campaign involving schools, cities, companies, others across America to celebrate kindness. And to me, that's a reminder about the work that we need to do in the big moments, but more importantly, in those small moments every single day of practicing kindness, of building that atmosphere for learning, where that psychological and physical safety is always present, so that kindness doesn't become something courageous, but it becomes an expectation. 
I think we also just need to acknowledge that it's hard. You know, Fred made it look so easy. Yeah. He made it look like, you know, we can look to Fred Rogers and think, I could never be him, so then we can walk away. That gives us leeway to act however we want. Mm -hmm. Fred was kind because he worked at it. He had a regimen. You know, we just put an op-ed out yesterday talking about this. Fred got up at 5 a.m. every single morning so he could basically, I don't think he called it this, but he, so he could meditate. He would envision who he was going to see that day, how he could treat them well, how he could show them humanity. Uh, he would follow that with a swim, kindness toward the body. Then he would have breakfast. He was always a vegetarian because he was kind to animals and the environment. He said he wouldn't eat anything that has a mother. Then he would go to the office. The first thing he would do at the office was answer every letter that came to his desk, which sometimes reached him, you know, he got 50 to 100 letters a day. He answered them first thing because he wanted to know that whoever reached out, he wanted someone, he wanted that person to know that someone would listen to them. Joanne uh, Rogers wrote the foreword to our book. Uh, it was one of the last things she did before she passed away. And in it, she writes, no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers himself. And I think because he made it look so easy, we forget that. The kindness is it's not this unattainable state. It's, it's a practice. It's something that we need to get up and, and work out every single day. Wow. So now I want to think about um, some of these amazing teachers, school administrators, school board members, and others who are so engaged in healthy development of children and how some of them might be leaving their posts yeah. because of the hostile and belittling behavior that they were seeing. From your research, what support or advice might, he, might Fred Rogers offer these adults, and what can we as a community do to help? Well, that's a hard question, too. Um, <laughs> first, I don't think Ryan and I would ever pretend to, um, to channel Fred Rogers. But what we can surmise from his blueprints um, is the importance of conveying grace and acknowledging that we're enough as we are. Um, if we practice the things that we've committed ourselves to doing. And so thinking of relationships, 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 what are the things that we can do so that individuals, and in this case adults, whether it's a superintendent, an assistant superintendent, a teacher, or a school board member doesn't feel isolated. And for me, that's part of the work of Remake Learning. It's so that an adult doesn't feel isolated. Because it might be that you're in a school district that maybe you can't just go down the hall because you have a colleague who has that same mindset, the same instructional approach, who's really trying to wrestle with whole child development theory and practice and the learning sciences in a way that maybe runs against the mandates that you've been given. But in a network of people, maybe you can find that colleague at the library. Maybe you can find that colleague at another school. So I think one of the things that we can do, and, and sitting in the privilege of philanthropy, one of the things that we can do in philanthropy that you know, maybe government mm -hmm. organizations and units can't do are create those social connections and then the networks that support those relationships among adults so that you can find your fellow Martians, that you don't feel isolated, that it's made easier to connect and to find the support that you need. And acknowledging that it's, it's OK, safe, and appropriate to seek that support when you want and need it. We can't speak for Fred, but we can quote him all day. <laughs> and uh, one of the things he used to say was, in times of stress, the best thing we can do for one another is to listen with our ears and our hearts and to be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. And I think sometimes that, I, I used to have trouble with that quote. It struck me as sort of a cop out. Um, but the more, you know, as I've been watching the fights break out over the past few months, the more it seems to me that absolute certainty is sort of at the root of all this. We are all so sure of ourselves that we are, have become unwilling to listen to other people. Um, I'm reading the latest book by George Saunders, Swim in a Pond in the Rain. If you haven't read it, it's fantastic. But in it, he talks about what happens you know, inside his brain as he gets to know characters in a story. And he, what he said is that, look, the more you get to know a character or a person in real life, the more information you take in, the less, the less you're able to pass too harsh of a judgment. And we see a lot of those harsh judgments being pass, passed around lately. He says, uh, this quote has been just banging around my head the past few days, what God has going for him that we don't is that he has access to unlimited information. 
Maybe that's why he's able to supposedly love us so much. And that just takes me right back to Fred. The more we learn about one another, the more we're willing to listen, again, even if we disagree. We might not come to consensus. We might walk away still disagreeing, but we'd be less willing to pass, pass those too harsh judgments on one another. Uh, we'd be less willing to attack one another in the way that I think we've been seeing. And it's not only discouraging, but setting a horrible example uh, for the kids we're supposedly fighting over. Exactly. So I have always wondered, so I'm learning, if a community really wants to place kids at the center, what are one or two things that we could try to get everyone engaged around that might have an impact? Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. And one of the tools that I love, again, whether it's a school or a library, community organization, um, to use is a graduate of a profile or a pro po profile of a learning learner, or in some cases, they're called learning portfolios. But what that tool allows us and maybe a school board, I'll use a school board and uh, an administrative team as an example in a school. If we want to develop a portrait of a learner and we think about that graduate, imagine her ultimately crossing that stage, re, you know, receiving that diploma. What is it that we want that diploma to represent? What is it that we want that learner to be? And something like the work of a, of a team of people working together, talking together about what a portrait of a graduate looks like beyond test scores, beyond obvious on-ramps to higher education or trades or others, who is that person? What does he or she know? What are the skills? What are the dispositions? What are the mindsets? That, that creates a, a space that allows for a much more constructive conversation. It allows for a lot of deep listening. It allows for exchange that might be disagreeable. But it's a rallying point for community. And we've seen school districts in our region. We've seen schools across the country. We've seen even state departments of education across the United States go through this process. And um, to me, that's an example of a great tool that allows us to step back, maybe not quite to the stratosphere, but to step back and have that sort of conversation about what it is that collectively we want to achieve. And it's a very tactical way to get there. See, I had a. Simpler idea, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Simpler is usually better. <laughs> well, I just thought that if everybody really understood wherever they are in the community, whoever they are, that they are a role model yes. for children. You know, even though you, the kids may not know you, may not, that they see you riding the bus, and if you pay your fare and you get down and you sit and you keep your mask on, you're modeling the behavior, right? If you're modeling behavior of what it is to be a parent for, for someone else's child when they see you with your children. And it just seems to me that if we could all just consciously think about everything we do, we're role modeling for the kids that are in our world, it's got to have an impact. I mean, that's the point of, of simple interactions. Yes. So um, we talked to, in the book, to Dr. Dana Winters, who heads the Fred Rogers Center. And she uses this tool to help people consciously recognize when those moments are occurring, when, again, we're communicating presence or inclusion or support. And she does this not only with teachers. She does this with crossing guards. She does this with uh, early child care uh, center workers. She does this with anyone who happens to interact with a child. And it's amazing when they show. So basically how this program works is simple interactions will come and videotape you just doing your thing. You know, they'll record you for 10 minutes. You won't even know they're there. And then you'll sit with a group, and they'll play the video back. And you'll use the simple interactions tool. It's, it's in the book um, to gauge, OK, are these moments, what are these moments doing for children in the moment? And Dana talks about how people's eyes just light up. They have no idea how much good they're actually doing. And the point is to show them, you know, these moments that you don't they even matter. know are occurring, they matter. they matter. And when you recognize that they matter, you can learn how to make more of them wherever you are and whoever you happen to be with. And they need to be practiced. I mean, yeah. we want, you know, good humans assume that other humans will be good. But we know this type of behavior has to be practiced. So two more examples. The Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania has implemented a program they call Everyday Mentoring. So the mentoring movement nationally has moved from that well, they still tend to one-to-one -to -one mentoring and the quality of that, a group mentoring setting. But thinking of crossing guards, how might a mentoring organization support crossing guards to think about those moments that they see the child and the things that, that those crossing guards can notice and do um, in the 
maybe seconds that they're with a, a child crossing the street in the morning and in the afternoon. And the pattern and rhythm of doing that every day, what that means. I think too of a, an effort locally called One Kind Word. So One Kind Word was an example of a local organization working, for example, with Giant Eagle and working with cashiers and helping cashiers to understand how might I intervene in a moment when maybe a, a parent is um, with a child, is frustrated, you know, is you know, checking out groceries, and maybe um, you're starting to see behaviors like, oh, I know that's not good for the kid. And to intervene in that moment, to have the bravery to intervene and to know how to intervene and say like, oh, you know, I, I have two kids. I've had those moments where you're just, I'm losing it. Um, it's so hard, isn't it? And, and just finding those ways to connect, you know, to connect in that moment to diffuse a potentially abusive situation, right? Just things that, you know, any one of us can do, not as a trained psychologist, maybe not as a medical doctor, as a teacher, but in those everyday moments as a crossing guard, as a cashier, and how do we practice those and prepare people for those small moments that we know matter so much? See, that's why you said kindness has to be a movement, yes. right? That's, and that's what I think what I was trying to spur. So I want to give a few minutes for anyone in the audience who has some questions. Um, I know we were going to put the microphone up. Um, so I know you all have been having an opportunity to think about anything that you want to ask our friends here in the last few minutes that we have. And if you don't have questions, Kelly does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so Greg and Ryan, thank you for thank the you. Uh, talk and for the book. Uh, I wanted to ask, so I was doing the math. Uh, 1968, Fred Rogers went on, on the air. And uh, you said remake's 15 years old now. So pretty sure there's some uh, grown people out there who have grown up uh, with this expectation of how they're engaged with by educators. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and particularly in this region. So I'm wondering if, um, your, I know your research was focused on youth, but did you learn anything about what kind of learners these youth grow into? And maybe th things that might tell us how we can uh, meet some of their needs and adaptations we can make to meet their needs as they grow up. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the good news is that we've got social scientists, learning scientists, and others who are now doing <laughs> longitudinal studies here at the University of Pittsburgh and elsewhere who are, who are really trying to understand differently who today's learners are and what it is that they're becoming. And they're able to tap into some of the work that George Land and others have done for decades in understanding the creativity quotient and um, patterns and trajectories for young people. We don't have that sort of data yet. What we do have, for example, is the ethnographic research of Mimi Ito, who I mentioned earlier, who about 15 years ago began to do some extraordinary work in really understanding how it is that kids are changing. And I mentioned it in the context of, of really identifying ways that kids are identi identifying information differently, seeking affirmation differently, consuming and producing information differently. That body of research that is extended from UT Austin to um, schools in New England and beyond you know, is really helping us understand how kids today are fundamentally different, how we need to think differently about their learning environments. And, and as we've mentioned, other fields like the neurosciences are actually capturing brain imaging that is fundamentally different. What we don't have is, so on the other end, what is it that um, we know about kids? What we do know are some change patterns in when, one, when adults create different learning environments, approach their instruction differently, that learning is happening differently in those settings. I'd love to talk about the work of the Elizabeth Ford School District. So Elizabeth Ford is a, you know, quite frankly, a, a, a middling district in the sense of resources. Um, that's south of Pittsburgh, think of it as partly in the Rusting Valley, partly far suburbs, partly even rural. It's a curious mix of a place. But it's an example of a school district that has thought about spaces differently, created spaces differently like you have with the labs. They've gone about their professional development and learning differently. They've started purchasing technology, but other resources differently. And by traditional variables, they're seeing changes um, positively in test scores, math scores, um, summer acceleration, traditional variables. What we don't have in the field of education writ broadly, and certainly not in a longitudinal way, is well, what other learning is happening? Because we know so much other learning is happening. And we're hopeful that the learning sciences field in the coming 
you know, decade with support from the National Science Foundation, AIR and others will, will produce some different information that will further drive people to design spaces differently, think about designing um, schools of education differently and the instructional practices, really changing our behavior as, as adults in the ways that we support young people. So it's an inadequate but partial answer to your question. Ryan and Greg, I, um, we are so fortunate here in this region to work with so many of the people that you wrote about in this book. I think Aaron and I look to a lot of them um, for professional development for our staff here at the library. So actually reading this book felt like a great teaching tool for our staff because it encompasses so many things that we are trying to impart um, to our colleagues who work with kids and teens. So I am really curious if you are both hoping or if this is on its way to becoming a teaching tool um, for pre-service educators. So our initial answer to that, maybe a month ago, was like, we're not going down that road. <laughs> but so many people have asked a similar question that, yes, I mean, we have, we've actually given a few talks to teachers already, and a few folks have asked us, can we turn this into a course in some way? Can we turn this into a course for educators? Can we turn this into a course for young people themselves on, on, the, on the older end of the spectrum? Or they say, do you have a discussion guide that we can yeah. use? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, to answer both of your questions. It's not happening yet, but I think we're, we're on our way there. And a few folks, again, as Greg mentioned, um, in places as far flung as Argentina and Japan have been so interested in this work. And it's interesting because they're not interested so much in Fred. You know, we had assumed, and I think rightly, that in the United States, in Pittsburgh especially, the draw is Fred. People are going to pick this book up because they remember Fred. To have the interest of somebody who has no clue who Fred Rogers is and frankly doesn't care, but this stuff is resonating, that's, that's really encouraging and, and exciting. Well, and to pick up on the other part of your question, I mean, we're hopeful that this book is part of that movement of really changing a mindset about how we go about learning and supporting learning for today's young people and who it is that they're becoming and still becoming. And um, you know, that's one of our great hopes that this, this book can be part of that movement. And so when we think about professional development and learning, when we think about pre-service training, ideally this maybe becomes a tool because it's a book at the end of the day that's about Fred's blueprints for learning. And the more that we can utilize them, the, the, the more we know um, we're gonna achieve better things for our kids. I also wanna comment too, because your, your question made me think of a, a conversation I had just last week with um, Sana Joffrey. Sana leads the Chicago Learning Exchange. And, and they're doing work in Chicago um, in many ways that's modeled upon, but also completely contextualized to Chicago, similar to Remake Learning, right? And, and she made this comment about recognizing that young people have brilliance and abundance and supporting them with abundance. So when I think about recognizing the brilliance in abundance of young, uh, of all learners, right? It, that's a mindset. What I'm hopeful we're able to achieve and working every day in this region to achieve is connecting that abundance. Uh, and it's why obviously I care so deeply and passionately about things like Remake Learning, but also the other field building organizations in our region like Trying Together in the Early Learning Space, the Arts Education Collaborative, the Allegheny Partnership for Out of School Time. All of this is about helping us as adults and the systems for which we're responsible and that we create every day and making them better and supportive kids. Uh, one of the amazing things about Mr. Rogers is how he took television and turned that into a learning tool uh, when everybody was vilifying the, the learning merits of television. So I'm just wondering, as we interviewed right before a pandemic hit, uh, what successes or what uh, some of the lessons of Mr. Rogers are you seeing in virtual context that we can uh, also model and implement? Well, I, so, um... I'll speak both personally, but also because of the scanning and the work that we've been able to do with the statewide panel that I mentioned. So uh, to focus on schools, because it's been obviously such a large part of our attention during this pandemic and the change to remote learning, we've seen in ways that adults, that parents, have connected differently with their schools. 
and being able to zoom in for um, meetings with teachers, uh, being able to zoom in for more comprehensive plans if a student has an individual educational plan. And teachers and schools will report about the increased levels of engagement with parents, families, and caregivers. And in fact, there's some work underway in this region. Schools working with IDEO, a design firm out of San Francisco, Brookings Institute in Washington that's doing a lot of work around parent-family engagement, and an organization in Helsinki called 100 that's really putting a spotlight this year on parent engagement and using all of that data and evidence to help schools from New Brighton to Fort Cherry and Brownsville think differently about parent family engagement. And so much of that is facilitated in a different way, not only by a technology, but because of our behaviors and practices with that technology during the course of, of this year. With respect to students, um, you know, it's been well reported among teachers that for better or worse, Zooming or Microsoft Teaming or whatever verbs you into kids' classrooms, rooms, has built up a different sort of empathy and a different sort of understanding about who their students actually are, about the circumstances into which they're actually coming into school. And so because of that, so many teachers report thinking very differently about how they're supporting relationships, whether it's in a virtual way or uh, in a very personal way. And it's partly what drove schools in particular to become so involved in the delivery of food in, in an enhanced way, in finding ways to connect students with mental health support and services. It's, it's just changed the practices because of that empathy that's build, been built up. And that technology has allowed for that two-way empathy to build up. And that's what we got to capture um, right. you know, in supporting learning going forward. Was that responsive to your question? Brian, you alluded to this earlier, but when I was reading the book, I was so curious how many episodes of Mr. Rogers that you two actually read in order to, you know, you do such a wonderful job of all of the local stories you're telling are matched up to episodes of the show. So I was really curious how many episodes you watched in order to put all those pieces together. Thank you. I That's a, a question great too. question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think that we kept an official count. Um, what our process generally was, is we'd have a sort of thesis for the chapter. And then we would go looking for episodes that would illustrate that. And the thing about the neighborhood is that it was never hard to find confirmation of, of our thesis. Because he did the same sorts of things in every episode, even though the variables changed. It became much more of a challenge to find what's the best one. And so then that was an excuse to you know, watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood all day on a Tuesday or something like that. Um, I don't know how many episodes, but I will say it was just such a pleasure to go back to that program as an adult. Um, there are things, you know, I think we both have sort of vague memories. Uh, we, we remember the Cran Factory episode and you know, certain moments stuck with us. But to go back as an adult and to see the incredible patience that he had in the program and the incredible trust that he put in children, that he trusted his viewers to be able to, if you've seen the documentary, there's the scene where he turns the egg timer down and he just lets it count down for a minute. There are scenes in the neighborhood where he literally sits and watches paint dry. I mean, for, for minutes at a time. The fact that he trusted kids to be interested and to stick with him, um, that is something that I wish I had had more of as a teacher, trust. I think I would have been able to do some really amazing things had I not thought, oh, my, my kids have to be engaged. We have to be doing something flashy or, or complicated every single second. He knew that kids will stick with an adult who trusts them. He used to say that attitudes are caught, not taught. And I hope we caught a little bit of his, his attitude while we immersed ourselves in the neighborhood for almost three years. Well, and two postscripts to that. One is their surprise as an adult going back. Ryan mentioned earlier how much Fred took on hard topics. Their surprise in going back to that work and, and seeing a week on divorce, in seeing um, episodes about war and violence. And the very first episode, King Friday yeah. builds a border wall. I mean, there are parents, I think there are some parents who would not let, watch, not let their children watch Mr. Rogers today if they knew some of the stuff that he tackled. Well, it's hard to imagine a children's multimedia producer tackling subjects in 2021 the way that Fred did. Um, it's just maybe a reflection of who we are and where we are.
the other thing that I want to mention in PostScript is to elevate the work of the archives at the mm. Fred Rogers Center. Mm -hmm. Emily, the archivist there, is just sort of an extraordinary person. What she has done, what the center has done in making that um, archive accessible, relevant, important, uh, has been so critical to us and scholars and, um, and fans of Fred Rogers and, and what a resource that is for us in this region, but scholars around the world. If you ever wrote a letter to Mr. Rogers, you can probably go find your letter in the archive. There are tens of thousands of them in there. And you can see his handwritten notes. You can see his sort of offhand thoughts. He, he just jotted down to himself. It's a really, you know, we can never get into Fred's head, but to sit there with those documents and to sit there with his, his notes to himself is just an incredible experience. Yeah, it's like the Mr. Rogers version of those Warhol time capsules, right? <laughs> like it's just sort of in a totally different way. <laughs> well, Greg and Rain, thank you so much for taking right, time. Thank you. Me. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for setting this up.